Hi everybody, I'm Skip Elsheimer. Welcome to the AV Geeks Lunchtime Streaming Show, where I'm trying to reposition my webcam. Um, I recorded a show for uh, the Saturday Morning Dyna Show yesterday, and what that means is I have to reconfigure my webcam all the time uh, to accommodate different uh, streaming services um, aspect ratios. Anyways, we watch old 16 millimeter films here and have some of us have lunch. Uh, so that was Arcadian Land, which was from the Mogul Brothers collection. And uh, Mogul Brothers was a library that you could rent films from or purchase films from. It was based in New York City. And uh, some of that collection, and, or most of that collection, ended up at Anthology Film Archives. And then uh, it went to different places. Some of it went to Prelinger Archives and Library of Congress, and some of it went to Oregon Archive, of which we've been uh, scanning uh, those films and showing them to you. So, yeah, somebody in the comments said, hey, this is the 100th year of 16 millimeter." Yes, it is. Uh, and excitedly, we've been celebrating 16 millimeter films and showing them almost exclusively um, since we started doing this. And now we're on episode 908, and uh, we've watched more than 4,000 films and stuff. All right. Uh, I'm surprised I haven't shown this one, and it's possible it just did not get logged, but we're going to watch it. Actually, I'm going to type it in to my spreadsheet and see. It's chalk and chalkboards. Um, it is the uh, other aspect to audiovisual materials. Audiovisual materials don't necessarily have to be animated or motion uh, motion pictures. They can be uh, film strips, which are still. They can be slides. They can be transparencies. And believe it or not, bulletin boards and uh, chalkboards might fall in that. So imagine what this show would be like if I was into collecting chalkboards. Um, so think about that while we're watching this film. Enjoy. <laughs> There are many visual aids, but one of the oldest is the chalkboard and chalk. Whether you call it a chalkboard or a blackboard, you'll find it in nearly every classroom. Although it has many advantages, there are occasionally some problems. For example, perhaps you've had ghost marks left when the chalk is erased. Maybe you've had a colored drawing that just could not be removed. Or your chalk doesn't show up as well anymore and gets more difficult to erase. These problems can be solved, but to do so, you should know exactly what a chalkboard is. For years, the best chalkboard materials have been slate, wood pulp, and cement asbestos. Many other materials coated with abrasive paint also have been tried, but beware of novelty boards. You may be surprised to learn that the surface of a chalkboard is not smooth. If you were to look at it in a simplified cross-section, you could see tiny hills and valleys. This roughness is called the bite. The chalk is worn away as it moves over this rough surface, leaving a mark on the board. A good bite is essential if your chalkboard is going to read clearly and erase properly without shine or glare. Chalk is important too. All of this looks about the same, but there are differences. It's difficult to tell quality or grade at a glance.
this is the best grade on the market. Technically, it contains 95% or more pure English precipitated whiting. This is medium grade chalk, which is about half domestic whiting and half common clay. It looks glazed and slick. This is the cheapest chalk. It is tapered, full of holes, and contains hard particles that may damage your chalkboard. The best chalk erases easily and completely. Medium grade chalk erases too, but is apt to leave the ghost marks that may have troubled you. Low grade chalk is more difficult to erase and leaves even more obvious ghost marks. Is it worth taking a chance with anything but the best when the difference in price between the grades of chalk is only about five cents per gross? Colored chalk quality is important too. These pieces look the same except that some are more vivid in color. But notice how the pastel colors show up better on the chalkboard. This is top quality chalk made especially for chalkboard use. This is chalk made for paper. It is difficult and sometimes impossible to erase. You won't have this trouble if you use chalk made especially for chalkboard use. It erases as easily and as completely as first grade white chalk. Chalk made for paper cannot be erased, but that doesn't mean it can't be removed. How should you normally clean a chalkboard? Never with an oil-based cleaner or one of the commercially treated cleaning cloths. Over a period of time, these oil-based cleaners will leave a shiny, oil-coated surface that has glare spots, is hard to write on and difficult to erase. If your board already has such a surface, you can remove it. Also, the ghost marks and the chalk made for paper. Use a damp cloth and a mild abrasive household cleanser. Neither the water nor the abrasive will harm a good chalkboard if used properly. But test in an obscure corner first. If no finish is removed, you are reasonably safe in proceeding. It takes only a light rubbing to remove these three troublemakers. After the marks are gone, erase, wash, and rinse the board thoroughly with clear water in order to remove the dissolved chalk. If you don't do this, the dissolved chalk will be deposited in the valleys of the chalkboard surface gradually giving the board a smooth, biteless surface that is difficult to write on and causes glare. Avoid this by always rinsing the board thoroughly with clean water and then allowing it to dry, preferably overnight. After the board has dried, it must be broken in in the same way as a new board. Hold the chalk flat and rub it over all of the writing surface. Then erase it. This leaves a thin film of chalk which is necessary for writing and erasing ease. For regular cleaning, use the dry cleaning method. A good grade felt eraser with several strips of felt is recommended. To remove still more of the chalk, use a piece of Turkish toweling or a chamois. With a chamois-backed eraser, you can wipe off the bulk of the chalk with the felt side and finish up with the chamois side. Clean the chamois side frequently with a cloth. 
You can keep your erasers and chalk tray clean by using an eraser cleaner regularly. Building custodians will usually perform much of this work, but you should make sure that the chalkboard is clean and well chalked in whenever you use it. With your chalkboard in good condition, there are lots of ways to use it for better teaching. With the whole class, of course. And with small groups. Use your chalkboard for individual work, too. Its size alone sometimes aids in solving problems and presenting ideas. To make complicated chalkboard work simple, there are many aids you can buy or make. For repetitive work, a simple template may be cut from hardboard or plywood. Notice how the handle makes it easier to use. These outline templates may be made for many purposes. They ensure a true picture quickly. A school-made large-scale T-square is a good aid for making straight lines. Triangles have many uses. An adjustable parallelogram, which may be made or purchased, makes various angles as well as horizontal and vertical parallel lines. This easy-to-make guide helps draw a series of parallel lines. It's easy to use opaque or overhead projectors to transfer illustrations to chalkboards. On another occasion, the same teacher is using a film strip projector. Notice that she is using a felt nib pen to make a permanent outline on an auxiliary chalkboard. You might find or buy an extra piece of chalkboard, or you may make one by painting a piece of plywood with chalkboard paint. This is a special paint, so follow the directions carefully. The permanent lines do not erase, so you can quickly illustrate a variety of things on the same basic outline. You'll have ideas for using this technique in your teaching. In drawing, notice how much less effective the house made with weak lines is than that made with strong ones. Make a forceful illustration with confidence and emphasis. Simplicity accents sharpness. The sharper the illustration, the stronger the sense impression will be. Color adds emphasis. Use it to focus attention. In this more advanced situation, a technical diagram illustrates the action of water and sunlight on growing plants. You may already know many ways to use colored chalk in your teaching situations. Remember to use the right kind, made especially for chalkboards. Simple cartooning will give you lively illustrations that will be remembered longer. A circle creates cartoon characters. Lines turning up show happiness. Those turning down, unhappiness. Stick figures can be made in a variety of poses. An inexpensive book on stick figures will be helpful. Additional lines, directional arrows, and speed lines can make your cartoons move. Don't try to be realistic. Sketch quickly and briefly. It's easier than you think. 
Fancy scripts and old English lettering are too difficult to read and to do. Good chalkboard lettering should be bold and purposeful. Strong, clear, vigorous writing that can be read from the back of the room attracts and holds attention. You'll find that guidelines are real aids to lettering and writing. These faint ones can be seen easily only by those near the board. They are being made with a water crayon of a color similar to that of the chalkboard. These lines won't erase, but they can be washed off. If you want more permanent lines, use a felt nib pen, but remember they will be difficult to remove. As you are seeing, chalkboards have many uses and advantages. For example, they are readily available. They are stimulating to fast and slow learners alike. Have you ever noticed how some of your best ideas come in the middle of a lesson? The readily available chalkboard quickly and easily helps to visualize your point so all will understand. Chalkboard illustrations can show action. The drawing of these lines on a chalkboard map involves action and makes learning more interesting. It also increases retention. Chalkboards help develop logical sequence. Take this group for instance. The flexibility of the chalkboard helps the instructor expand his work at the proper speed for each class. Good chalkboard work involves student ideas. This is not a teacher-illustrated lecture. In this well-taught lesson, the students contribute their ideas and information. The technique is identical in the developmental approach, regardless of the subject area or grade level. Chalkboard work focuses attention. This student is highlighting a lesson for the class by listing these specific points. Be sure that your chalkboard use permits group participation. Most teachers find frequent opportunities to send part of their students to the board while the rest of the class does the same work at their seats. Chalkboards are adaptable. Notice the many different ways these teachers are using chalk and chalkboards. We've just reviewed seven ways that chalkboards help make teaching better, but there are many more. Put your imagination to work. Use the right chalk. Take proper care of your chalkboard and you'll enjoy many experiences of better, more satisfying teaching. Wow. That film was great. Um, so, obviously made for teachers or educators, uh, and teaches all the fine points of chalkboard, chalkboardery, uh, the only place I, f I find that use chalkboards nowadays are uh, bars. <laughs> like, um, <clears throat> I see oftentimes, you know, uh, like a microbrewery or a bar, bottle shop or something that has a chalkboard and then somebody has gone in and drawn in, uh, or a board is like outside of a coffee shop or something like that and it says, you know, something clever. And the fact is that they don't, they don't use chalk. They have markers that have a chalk-like uh, opaque consistency. Uh, and that's how they, they do it. That's how they draw stuff. So there you go. All right. Um, we're going to try to watch this film over here. It's a little beat to hell. Um, it's How Blood Clots. Enjoy.
Every human cell requires food and oxygen and a way to remove waste products. A remarkable way by our circulatory system. The heart at the center of this system pumps a fluid tissue called blood through the arteries, capillaries, and veins which make up the blood vessels. Here we see blood vessels lying close to the surface of the skin. Blood circulating in these vessels contains cell foods, waste products, and other substances in the amounts needed to maintain good health. When a vessel is damaged, some of the materials in the blood help the system to repair itself. Escaping blood is made to clot. and the injured vessel is resealed. Here is another example of blood clotting at the site of an injury to a blood vessel. We can learn more about how blood clots by observing a sample of human blood. At room temperature, our blood sample begins to clot in a few minutes. We are watching this clot formation in fast motion. After several hours, the blood has separated into a red clot and yellow serum. What role does each part of the blood play in the clotting process? Using a centrifuge to spin blood samples at a rapid rate, we can separate blood into solid and liquid parts. We prevent the blood from clotting in the centrifuge by adding a special chemical. The blood separates into solid particles at the bottom and liquid plasma at the top. We can then find out what plasma is composed of by treating it with certain chemicals. These chemicals react with substances in plasma to form solids. The solids are then removed and identified. All of the components of plasma can be isolated by repeating these separations with different chemicals. When plasma is broken down this way, scientists find that 90% is simply water. The remaining 10% consists of cell foods, calcium, the protein fibrinogen, the enzyme prothrombin, and many other substances. Calcium, fibrinogen, and prothrombin are among a dozen known clotting agents found in plasma. In addition to plasma, human blood contains solid particles called blood cells. Over 25 trillion blood cells will be found in the blood system of the average adult. Most of the cells are red corpuscles. They give the blood its red color. Here we see them being carried along by the flow of plasma in the blood vessel. The red corpuscles transport oxygen from the lungs to the body cells and return carbon dioxide to the lungs. Another type of blood cell is the white corpuscle. Although they differ in size and nucleus structure, all white cells are thought to help destroy bacteria and other foreign bodies in the bloodstream. 
The only other solid particles in the blood are called platelets. These appear as clusters of tiny bodies among the red and white cells. Platelets, like red corpuscles, are not whole cells. They have no nuclei and cannot reproduce. But within these fragments lies the key to the process of blood clotting. Scientists know that red and white corpuscles develop from cells in the bone marrow. But where do platelets come from? They looked for the answer in bits of bone marrow grown in cultures like this. Through the microscope, they saw many cells in the marrow. they focused their attention on one type. It was large and spherical. During a 24-hour period, the cell underwent an unusual transformation, which we see here in fast motion. pieces formed from the aging cell. They seem to be exactly like platelets found in the blood, except for the threads connecting them. Scientists now believe that something in the body dissolves these threads and releases the beads into the bloodstream where we recognize them as platelets, those in the process of blood clotting. At the injured area of a blood vessel, platelets gather in large numbers, forming a white clot that temporarily seals the wound. But some of the platelets escape with the blood. They begin a chain reaction which causes the blood to clot. Aided by other clotting agents, the platelets react with calcium to produce a substance called thromboplastin. Then the thromboplastin reacts with prothrombin and calcium, forming a new compound, thrombin. Finally, thrombin combines with fibrinogen to produce a thread-like substance called fibrin. Although the formation of fibrin is near the end of the clotting process, it is the only part which is visible under the microscope. Here we see fibrin forming in slow motion. The white dots are platelets. Fibrin threads form a mesh which can trap red and white cells. The trapped cells give the clot its red color. As the mass dries out, it forms a scab. Now let's watch the clot form at normal speed. Do you think that blood would clot if it had no red or white cells? 
This fresh plasma sample is essentially blood without red or white cells. Broke. Um, that's annoying. Yeah, this film is really beat up. Uh, all right. Uh, let's see. I got a lot of challenges for you. A lot of questions for you. Can you take it? Certainly, the majestic aurora is one of the most remarkable and fascinating spectacles presented to us by the heavens at night. In Alaska, the aurora is not always in the northern sky, as it appears from lower latitudes. Here, it often comes directly overhead and goes into the southern half of our sky. The great bands of glowing rays, 1,400 miles east to west, extend from horizon to horizon. Throughout the ages, man has viewed the aurora in awe and wonder. But it's more than an object of awe and wonder, it's a subject of scientific curiosity and study. And one center for this study is the Geophysical Institute of the University of Alaska. Here, Dr. Sidney Chapman, a leading authority on solar disturbances and their effects on magnetic fields, aids other scientists and graduate students like myself in our attempts to unravel the riddle of the aurora. I've been a part of this research for the past two years. But the story doesn't begin here. It was seven years ago, in high school. Dr. Chapman came to talk to our science club. He told us about his life as a scientist and the tremendous range of opportunities open to young people today. He mentioned that since the University of Alaska was our northernmost academic community, it offered many unique chances to study polar phenomena at first hand. Well, he aroused my curiosity, and I wanted to see for myself. Going to the University of Alaska was like discovering another planet. The long shadows gave the campus a strange appearance. It was almost a perpetual twilight. I got used to these new surroundings much quicker than I got used to the rigorous study schedule. The long hours in the labs and classrooms gave me plenty to do. My books became regular midnight companions. But during my undergraduate years, I had a chance to see science as a way of life as well. Because of the government-sponsored projects, there were many research installations around Fairbanks. The wilderness fairly bristled with radio telescopes. Alaska had another gold rush, research. Some friends of mine worked at Belaine Lake Ionosphere Monitoring Station. The heavy snows gave them some problems too. They flipped a coin to see who would do this job. The largest of these installations was the Gilmore Satellite Tracking Station. Its 85-foot tracking dishes were nestled in a valley and surrounded by a ring of mountains which cut down electrical interference. One day we jumped in the snowmobile and went up to see one of the sighting towers. We wound our way up seven miles of trail through snow about five feet deep.
As I became better acquainted with these installations, I began to see how my studies related to the instruments out in the wild Alaskan ranges. I wanted to become part of a research team. In graduate school, I found that my 16 years of education had been years of preparation, years that provided me with the basic tools of knowledge. Now I had to dig in. Dr. Chapman's lectures gave us a background in the history of research in the Aurora. This chart was first published in 1860. It was the result of years of work by Dr. Elias Loomis of Yale University. He spent years questioning people who had seen an aurora. Finally, he had recorded enough detailed information to show that the auroral activity centered around Greenland. This, not the North Pole, was the true geomagnetic pole. As our studies became more complex, our questions became more frequent, but Dr. Chapman always had time to help us. Later in the school year, we began our studies on the modern tools of research. One of these tools in use at the university's observatory at Esterdome was the all-sky camera. After seeing the aurora at first hand, it was easy to understand that no camera can capture its true beauty and magnitude. The all-sky camera, by taking a picture of an area of 360 degrees and 1,400 miles of sky is by far our best device. By taking time-lapse photography of this vast portion of the midnight sky, we learn something of the aurora's scale and pattern. And when these pictures are placed together, we are able to see its activity and change. These undulating rays of light, which have perplexed man for thousands of years, are believed to be caused by a flow of charged particles from the sun. These particles imprisoned by the Earth's magnetic field collide with our outer atmosphere and produce this glow. The fluctuation of these strange lights is relative to the intensity of the solar storms. The Geophysical Institute first began using the all-sky cameras in 1957. Today they are still one of our most important sources of information. These cameras are placed strategically around our globe and take one picture a minute of the aurora in action. Since the areas covered by these cameras overlap slightly, we are able to see, in a continuous line, the area any given aurora encompasses. The films taken around the world by these cameras are kept here at the World Data Center. The evaluation of these all-sky records is part of my postgraduate training. These excellent research facilities give me the opportunity to keep up to date with the latest scientific developments. And so the research begun by Professor Loomis was carried on by many men, incorporating more modern techniques. Dr. Chapman had a profound respect for these men, men whose creative research laid the foundation for modern investigations of this polar miracle. In the words of Dr. Chapman. I have been fortunate during my long career to be associated with many distinguished scientists. In the 1920s, Dr. Ferraro, when a PhD student working with me at London University, helped to originate the concept of a cavity carved by the Earth's magnetic field in a stream of gas from the sun. Theirs was the first satisfactory explanation of the relationship between sunspots, magnetic storms, and the aurora. It begins with the sun. An explosion takes place in a group of sunspots. A stream of ionized gas spurts out into space, finally intercepting our planet in its orbit. But the Earth's magnetic field acts as a shield against this cloud. These charged particles are deflected around the Earth shaping a hollow in the cloud. Dr. Chapman and Dr. Ferraro knew that this constant flow of particles compressed our magnetic field. They felt that this compression might explain the fluctuations of this magnetic field during a solar disturbance. But how could these particles enter our planet's atmosphere? Obviously, somewhere in this void, the particles must enter our magnetic field. The aurora is glowing proof of that. Dr. Chapman knew that in 1931. How could their theory be proved? 
32 years later, November 1963, the IMP satellite was launched. It carried a load of scientific instruments. This interplanetary monitoring platform orbited above the equator for 183 days, and the data it collected did prove several things. The magnetic field of the Earth was compressed in the direction of the Sun, just as Dr. Chapman had theorized. But on the far side of the Earth, the imp recorded no disturbance of passing out of this magnetic field, even though its orbit carried at 30 Earth radii, more than 120,000 miles, into space. It conclusively confirmed the existence of the magnetosphere, bounded by a shockwave region, but there were many riddles of the aurora that it did not answer. But the answers are sure to come. Sometime, somewhere, new clues will be found. Maybe we have some of them now and just cannot yet interpret them. Dr. Chapman was very pleased with the findings of the satellite. The theory that he and Dr. Ferraro had proposed 32 years before was finally proved by the newest of man's scientific instruments. We graduate students were quite excited about this use of satellites, but Dr. Chapman quickly reminded us that some of the discoveries made at the turn of the century were just as exciting. For instance, in 1909, Dr. Sturmer, a Norwegian scientist, photographed the aurora from two different points on Earth simultaneously. His method made it possible to determine both the height and location of the aurora. Dr. Chapman's lectures showed us that today, though we use much more complex means, we are still gathering the same sort of information. Today we can bounce a radio wave off the aurora, and by measuring the length of time it takes the echo to return to Earth, we can pinpoint its location, even in the daytime. So research in the aurora continues. There will be from time to time phenomena different from and more remarkable than those we've yet observed. The evidence got at a place like Esther Dome, it will be one important token of such exceptional events. At Esther Dome, I worked with the team recording information on auroral activity. We began making preparations in the afternoon. The all-sky cameras had to be checked. Are the lenses centered? the mirror in the dome free of frost. The new turret holding a modified television camera was checked for alignment. The auroral intensity recorder was prepared. New tape was loaded into the spectrograph to record the content and makeup of radiation from the aurora. The television film recorder was loaded. A final call was made to Point Barrow a heavy overcast there. Would our weather hold? Sunset. Still okay. We needed only one thing. The aurora. An hour later, the needles on the intensity recorder began to quiver. There was going to be plenty of action in the skies tonight. And action there was. For over three hours, all eyes and instruments focused on the aurora as the all-sky camera recorded this brilliant display. had been a success. We had exact measurements of the intensity, location, and magnitude of this particular aurora. This information would be added to other data, and we hoped that someday it would help establish a full explanation of the mysteries of the aurora. Years ago, in that high school classroom, I had no idea I'd be here today, working with other scientists, working to meet the challenge of unanswered questions. As I think back over those years, I can see Dr. Chapman's influence on me. What will you do in science? Where will you go? 
Maybe you will be the one to circle the globe across each pole, north and south, in a satellite. There, looking from above, the whole grand spectacle of the aurora spread over the dark Arctic winter sky may be open to your view using new, more sophisticated instruments. Thus, man may overcome limitations to his understanding of the aurora. This may be your experience, or you may in other ways be one of the long line of workers who have built up our knowledge of this fascinating phenomenon. Oh yeah, <laughs> everything's being explained in exhausting detail today. Uh, here's some some light uh, information for you to digest um, to end the day. Enjoy. That old black magic has me in its spell. That old Black magic that you weave so well. When you're smiling, when you're smiling, the whole world smiles. Tell us, Henri, tell us. It is Lily. She has betrayed me. Last night, she was in the arms of another man. What you did last night was utterly contemptible. You knew I thought you were my husband. Sure I did. We had a lot of fun, didn't we? Oh, you vulgar, insufferable. Wait a minute. What's the matter with what I did? Didn't you like my performance? I certainly did not. Well, I'd like to know anyone who could have done better. You do the eagle rock with such style and grace You put your left foot out You bring it back That's what I call ballin' the jack Oh, 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 the puppet a fellow that you ought to know Happy ending every time Drama, tense and gripping beyond words, painted in the flaming red of murder, the searing white of desire, the brooding black of betrayal. And you're my wife. You don't go anywhere alone. Matt, you're hurting me. Portrait in Black, starring Lana Turner. Sh shall I get a doctor? Yeah. Huh? How about your friend Rivera? <laughs> One desire. Starring Ann Baxter as the notorious Tacey, who tried to turn her back on her reputation. Rock Hudson as Clint Saunders, who'd gamble on anything, even love. Julie Adams as Judith, rich, spoiled, but she offered a shortcut to success. And you had been a dance hall girl since 16. And still you consider yourself fit to care for two children. How oh, you married me, and you're going to stay married to me. So sneak around back alleys, if that's the kind of man you are. Carry on in dark corners with that tramp. I'm sure she'll be more than willing. Why, Daisy, why? Why do people make such bad mistakes before they learn? 
How many times have I asked myself that question? Against an unleashed flood of Roman legions, one man with the strength of many fights determinedly. He is Glaucus, son of Hercules, the hero leader of the Britons. Depravity, treachery, the soul of the devil in a beautiful woman. Against this evil, Glaucus hurls more than just his defiance. Fiendish torture to satisfy the bloodlust of a crazed beast. To free his beloved and his enslaved countrymen, Glaucus, son of Hercules, alone defies an empire and the power-hungry Messaline. A film packed with action, breathtaking in its suspense. Adventure and danger beyond endurance. Kill. See Glaucus, son of Hercules, pit his might against overwhelming odds and the evil heart of a beautiful woman. Produced in the tradition of great spectaculars, see Messalina against the son of Hercules. If this house was good enough for Edgar Allan Poe, it's good enough for us. Hey, why don't you watch where you're going? Hey, that guy didn't know where he was going. Fool! D Dad, watch out! You're getting too close. Hey, where do you think you're going? Watch out! Well, I'm terribly sorry, but the doorknob came off. I'm going to have to get somebody to let me out of here. Peggy! You know what I wish we had? Another little party. You mean a, a drink? Oh, yes. Marty and I always take a little something to relax us before go, go, going to bed. <laughs> All right. Try to mix it up a little there for you. That uh, came from uh, Craig Baldwin's collection. Craig Baldwin, uh, based in uh, San Francisco. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, longtime filmmaker, collector. Um, nice guy. Uh, a book just came out uh, about him that is... Do I have it here? It's like 500 pages. It's crazy how big it is and really awesome. Yeah, I don't have it here. Um, but it comes with all sorts of cool stuff. And uh, so anyways, he's been sending me stuff, and I've been scanning it for him uh, for stock footage and so he could use it. But uh, this was some of the stuff he sent. And I don't know. I don't think we've shown this before, but sometimes we do. Sometimes we show stuff because he, he, he kind of recompiles things, and I'm like, wait a minute. This kind of seems familiar. Anyhow. Thank you so much for showing up today and watching and commenting. Uh, I saw some new names in the comments, and we love having you, so welcome. If you like what you saw, there's a couple ways you can help us. One way is hitting the thumbs up button, the like button, uh, subscribing. You see I got this, this plaque because there's 100,000 subscribers. Well, you can keep, keep it rolling so we can get 200,000. Um, that would be great. I don't know what they'll send me. Maybe a, a nifty gold watch, or maybe just another another 100 plaque that I just kind of connect with some tape. Um, you can also uh, donate some cash via the Super Thanks feature in YouTube's chat. You can also go to ko-fi.com slash abgeeks and donate some coffee to us, or go to patreon.com slash abgeeks. Uh, we had to buy more rubber gloves because uh, our interns, or, are working with some nasty stuff and they don't want to get the nasty on their hands so uh, we've been burning through gloves recently um, another way you can just watch other films that we have on our channel there's some advertising on there which is annoying but you know it uh it pays the bills uh, you can also if you have a short attention span watch us on tiktok uh, tiktok.com slash at av.geeks. How many more punctuation marks can I fit into that? Um, but thanks for tuning in. We'll be back again tomorrow. And uh, we will see you soon. Uh, take care, everybody. Enjoy your Monday. <laughs>